when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some unclean uncleanness in her, the len then let her wait her a bill of divorcement and give it to her hand, and send her out of his house. When she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it to her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the Lord to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken. No man shall take the nether or the upper milestone to pledge, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel, and maketh merchandise of him, or selleth him, then that thief shall die, and thou shalt put evil away from among you. Take heed in the plague of leprosy, that thou observe diligently, and do according to all that the priests, the Levites, shall teach you. As I commanded them, so ye shall observe to do. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Moram by the way. After that ye were come forth out of Egypt. When thou dost lead thy brother anything, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou doest lead shall bring out the plague abroad among thee. And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sum goeth down, that he may sleep in his own raiment, and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren, or by thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. But thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgotten a shelf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the burrows again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the window, widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thine vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. Amen. It's been several weeks since I was in uh, Deuteronomy, so I'll continue now with the study. Um, most of these chapters had an overall theme to them. I'm praying that God will give me clarity about what the theme of this chapter is. But whether or not the chapter itself has a theme, uh, some of these divisions, uh, though I believe God um, picked them for us in the King James Bible, we have them exactly how he wants them. Uh, they weren't there in the original text. It just kind of read one through another. And so sometimes you'll find actually that a verse at the end of a chapter kind of carries over into the next chapter. 
And when it does so, it carries on the theme perfectly and the thought and the idea. Nevertheless, there's a chapter division there. Sometimes I ignore them. Sometimes I use them as a, as a benefit to me in my study. But ultimately, they're there. They're good. It's, it's good to have them. But like I said, I may not have a, a full theme to this chapter. But there's some good topics here and good things to deal with. And the first one is the idea of divorce meant. Divorce. Uh, verse 1 there in chapter 24 reads this way. It says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. So here we have a man, and the Bible says he's taken this woman, and the order is as follows. He married her, then he found some uncleanness in her, then he therefore wrote the bill of divorcement, and then he sent her out of the house. So that's the order of operations here. Now, regarding this bill of divorcement, that specific phrase is in Mark chapter 10. So keep your finger there in Deuteronomy chapter 24, and we'll go to Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> There in Mark chapter 10, right at the beginning of the chapter, you'll find Jesus crossing paths again with these Pharisees. Mark chapter 10 and verse 1, And he arose from thence, and cometh into the coasts of Judea, by the farther side of Jordan, and the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Now look at this. It says, tempting him. So he, they're asking this question about whether it is legal, lawful, or not for a man to put away his wife. In other places in the Bible, they said for any cause. In other words, we can just put away that woman for any old cause. Is that legal? Is that lawful? Is that justifiable? And this they asked, the Bible says here, tempting him. Him. So you got to understand that when they come to him with that question, they're coming in the hardness of their own hearts in order to trip Jesus up, in order to make him expose himself by the words of his mouth. But it's not going to be that way because Jesus knows exactly the thoughts and intents of their heart. And as the word of God, he's going to expose them as a result of their own ignorance, their own attacks, their own tempting of the Lord here. So verse 3, it says, And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? Great, great key and great uh, tip here when dealing with people that are trying to tempt you and ask you questions to trip you up is just to respond with another question. It's the best way to deal with people, I believe, and Jesus does it all the time. What did Moses command you, he says? And they said, verse 4, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. Now, we just read, I believe, what they're referring to there in Deuteronomy chapter 24. And Moses didn't just say, write a bill of divorcement and put her away, did he? No, he said, he's taken the wife, he married her, he found some uncleanness, they left that out, then he wrote the bill of divorcement, then he sent her away. Okay, so they said all of these things after Jesus appealed to the law. They said, well, he suffered, he allowed them to do such and such. Write the bill, put her away. Now, this is a very permissive way of them stating this. Jesus suffered, or sorry, Moses suffered them. In other words, Moses allowed them, he permitted them. But when Jesus deals with it, I don't think he gives that same sort of permissive spirit to what they're trying to do here. We see that in verse 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote to you this precept. Okay? So as a result, Moses suffered them, yes, to write the bill of divorcement and put, them, put this woman away, but... It's not the same permissive spirit, I hope you can see that, that the Pharisees came with. The Pharisees came and said, well, Moses just allowed them to write the bill of divorcement and get rid of them. But in the context of Matthew or Deuteronomy chapter 24, Moses didn't just allow them to do that. No, Moses, for the hardness of their heart, put up with them having this play out in order, taken, married, found a blemish, bill of divorcement, put her out of the house. He 
put up with their hardness and out of necessity of the very hardness of their heart, he gave them this stipulation for release of the marriage. But God's going to show that his perfect will is nowhere near this putting up with the hardness of people that they think it is. They think that Jesus and Moses are just allowing them to do whatever they want in regards to this. But Jesus says, no, 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 this is not my perfect will, nor is this how things ought to be. This is written because your hard hearts required such a thing to be written. Verse 6, it says, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but watch this, but one flesh. Okay? So what he's saying here is, from the beginning, this was God's intent. He created them a male and a female. He wants a man to leave his father and mother, cleave to his singular wife, and it says here, they twain shall be one flesh. I believe Christ here is indicating that the union of male and woman has taken place. On top of the marriage vows, on top of the, the promise to be together, they became one flesh in the marital act. Okay, so Christ continues and he says, What therefore, verse 9, God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So his perfect will in the lives of male and female is that they would come together, twain would be one flesh, and what God joined together in that union, no man ought to put asunder. In other words, someone outside the marriage ought not put that asunder. Someone inside the marriage ought not write that bill of divorcement and put her asunder, put it away, and, and, and throw that marriage out. So that is his perfect desire, is that they would be married husband, wife, together forever, and that is what he wants. But, obviously, there's more to this. Verse 10, and the disciples know that there's more to this, because it says in verse 10, and in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matters. So he gives them a straightforward answer. He asks the Pharisees, well, what did Moses say? They misquote him. They snip out the true intent of that passage and only take what they like. I'm going to put her away for any cause. Jesus says, no, male, female, come together. This is my intent. One flesh never to cease. That is my desire, that they would live together married. The disciples, though, come, and I believe because of the state of the world that they're living in, they come to him and say, Jesus, are you, are you sure? Are, are you sure about this? Because everyone around me is getting divorced. The whole world is full of broken up marriages. This doesn't seem even realistic, Lord. What's the deal here? So in verse 10, his disciples asked him of that same matter. They asked him privately of this teaching. Probably thought that was fair enough to just dismiss what the Pharisees are dealing with because they knew they had a hard heart. They knew that, that their heart was just to put away their wife and remarry. It's not a big deal. But the disciples are thinking, well, my heart isn't to go to that extreme and just put her away for any cause. But certainly there would be causes for me to put away my wife. Wouldn't you say, Lord, wouldn't there be godly reasons for me to want to do this? And I believe that's why they came to him and asked him again of that same matter. But Jesus continues in the same van. He says to their question, basically, are you sure about this? Verse 11, and he saith unto them, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. They say, Jesus, are you sure? He's like, yeah, I'm sure. And, and he's even more firm with his disciples than he was with the Pharisees. He just taught the Pharisees the intent and perfect will of God. To the disciples, they'd heard the intent and perfect will of God, and he takes it further and says, and if you do so and marry another, that's adultery in the eyes of God. Absolutely, I'm sure. Now go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and let's look at the heart of this issue, the, 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 the bottom line of what they're talking about here. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, again, the Pharisees left out some key points there and that's that there was some uncleanness found. It says in verse 1, and I'll read right down to verse 4, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. What does that mean? It says, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. So she found no favor because of the uncleanness that he found. 
He says, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it into her hand and send her out of his house. Okay, continues on, and this is the wife's journey. It says, and when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Okay, so God here, through Moses, as a result of the hardness of the hearts of those people, says, okay, because the uncleanness was found, and because um, that results in no favor, the eyes of the man upon the woman that he has married, the bill of divorcement goes, she goes out, and she's now allowed and permitted to marry another man, another man, and be another man's wife. It says, and if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. So, what he's saying here is that... <clears throat> um, the wife is able to go away. She's able to marry another. And the first husband cannot take her again after something happens like a death or another divorcement. God forbid here. So what I believe is happening here is that what was found, some uncleanness, was a visible blemish. I don't believe that what they're talking about is a union that has taken place. I believe that this marriage was cut off before that union had taken place. I believe that when he was teaching the disciples, he was talking to all of them, perhaps from the perspective of married men, married men that absolutely they had already been with their wives for a long time. They'd consummated the marriage and it was final. You commit, you, you break that off. It's, it's absolutely adultery. But what happened here was that he took her, he married her ritually, and then it came to pass that the uncleanness was found and he puts her away. But what happens after the fact is she goes into parts, becomes another man's wife. There's a divorce that takes place there. Or the husband dies and she's now widowed. He can't take her again. In other words, I think that the first husband then saw that the, his perspective changed because somebody else had basically come through that uncleanness and they were unscathed as a result. And so he's like, well, maybe this one that I put away ain't so bad after all. And so his mind has changed and he thinks, all right, I'll take her now because somebody else has proven her uncleanness not to be um, a defilement. But God here very clearly says that while that uncleanness didn't didn't affect that second husband, she absolutely is defiled in this case in regard to that relationship between the first husband and her being restored. There's a defilement that has taken place. The continuation of verse 4, it says, For that is abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God hath given thee for an inheritance. In other words, this I don't like this one. I, I married her, dated her, tried it out for a bit. I didn't like her, put her away. This other man was with her, and now she's free on the mark again. I'm going to take her again. And there's this back and forth, always exchanging of marriage vows. Marriage means nothing. Marriage is just the swapping of women and men and this and that. That is abomination before the Lord, and that is something that causes the land to sin. Now, <clears throat> in regards to this, I think we should look at what's being said here in the law and realize, bottom line, a couple of things. The first is that this is the result of hardness of hearts of people that this was even written. It was written as a result of men being always caught up in things that are contrary to God. And we all find ourselves in scenarios like that where because of our upbringing, because of where we were born, because of our culture, because we weren't born into a family of believers and saved very young and lived our life in a certain way, we got caught in some of these mixed up, mashed up, confusing marital situations. And that's a problem, absolutely, and that is, is a result of the land sinning, but that is not God's original intent. And that's what we need to see. Two things. First and foremost, God's original and perfect intent, man, woman, together, forever, enough said. Man's all, God also here indicates that what he's giving us is a result of a sinful land. It's not right, it's not good, but unfortunately that's the reality in which we are all living. Okay, I'm sure every single one of us would not get offended by what's being spoken here because even though we may have gone through divorces, even though we may have had premarital um, engagements and done things outside of God's perfect plan, 
we look at that and say, yes, this is good because we all regret what happened in the past, don't we? And we don't want the next generation to make the same mistakes. Ideally, that sin would be put out of the land and people would start fresh and do things right. And our children would not make the same mistakes that we did. And they would meet one spouse and be with them forever and start fresh teaching their kids to do the same. But unfortunately, we're stuck in a world that is mixed up in this area. We are in a sinful nation that teaches people that fornication is okay, teaches people that adultery is okay, teaches people that divorce is okay. And it's not. It's sinful. It's wrong. It's abomination here before the Lord God. And it is as a result of hard hearts that we're even talking about this today because the intent of God is clear and it's the best for us. And that's what everybody should want. And me looking back, that's exactly what I want. I wish I could go back in time and correct all of the things that happened in my life before I had met my wife. I wish I would have been able to start over, but I can't. But what I can do is teach the next generation the good and right way. Don't let them get a hard heart. Don't let them think that these types of sins are okay. Don't let them think like the Pharisees that used religion snipping and clipping and trimming to say, I can divorce her for any cause. And just having that permissive spirit with respect to that. No, it's wrong. And the thing is that we also can see out of this whole teaching here is the importance of choosing the right spouse the first time. Now, few chapters back in Deuteronomy chapter 21, I dealt with this passage that was confusing to me at the time, but as often happens, I'll come up and I'll preach it kind of face value and just not get too deep onto what's happening here. I believe that I, I preached it correctly, but from a, a perspective that was just, just plainness, plain facedness of the scripture. But what I missed in dealing with this was... Um, <clears throat> What's happening isn't as shocking as I once thought it was. So in Deuteronomy chapter 21, let me go here again in verse 10. You remember, if you remember this, it says, When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Now what happens? Sees the beautiful woman, desires to have her for his wife. And she's of the unbelieving nations that they have just taken over. And it says, Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. Some sort of cleansing happens here. And she shall put raiment of her captivity from off her. In other words, she changes her clothes into something that is not of the captivity, but something that is, is more fitting for the position that she's about to step into. And it says, And shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and her mother a full month. So from verse 12 to that mid part of verse 13, we see basically this. Bring her home a full month. Okay, all the other in the middle is kind of details about what's going on. So he takes her and obviously if he you've destroyed that nation, that beautiful woman has no spot to live. So he brings her home for a full month. And this can be likened unto that courting time period. This can be likened unto dating, getting to know the person, trying to see if she's a good fit for you. Now, what I thought here originally was that I just should read this straight on down and it's the order of operations that God's giving. But while I read it that way the first time, I don't believe that anymore. It says, after a full month, and after that thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. Now, if I was to just read straight through, watch as it says, and it shall be if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money, and continues on, because thou hast humbled her. So, it says here that the marriage relationship had happened in verse 13. And if you just read it straight, it's like, so they come together, he finds no delight and puts her away. Isn't that adultery? Isn't that what has just taken place according to Jesus' teaching? Well, no, I don't believe that this is straight through anymore, but actually there's two options here. And watch as we read this. It says, okay, like I said in verse 12, bring her home a full month. Here's option A. Thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband and she shall be thy wife. Here's option B, and it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will. So here's the choices that you have. Marry her, bring her in, she's your wife. Or if you have no delight for her of her during that one month period, then just put her away. 
But it says that when you put her away, you're, you're not to sell her, you're not to make merchandise. You've humbled her. In other words, you've embarrassed her by what's taken place. You've taken her to you. She didn't work out. It didn't, wasn't what you expect, and therefore you put her away. So that's what I believe is happening here. But then you see from this teaching, as well as, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, you see then the importance of that dating portion, that, that courting portion, for lack of a better term. I don't like dating because dating is, has the connotation of, I'm going to try this one for a bit, and this one for a bit, and this one for a bit, and this one for a bit. There's always temptation, and people always get in with an inch of breaking God's perfect plan, and that's, you know, there's always a risk of fornication. There's a risk of, you know, kissing or touching or anything that goes on before marriage. I don't think, but when I say dating or when I say courting, what I mean is basically your intent is to marry. And that's what you see in Deuteronomy 24. And that's what you see as well in that group or that, that scenario that played out in Deuteronomy chapter 21. The intent was to marry. You just spent some time trying to figure out if that was the right direction for you. So you then see the importance of getting to know the woman that you intend to marry because ultimately in God's eyes, once a man has taken a wife, married her, and they know one another in the marriage relationship, that's it. That's final. That, in his eyes, ought to last forever. The hardness of the heart scenario comes from the fact that, that these things don't always take place exactly as planned. But I see here, though, that God in both scenarios is not advocating for divorce in any way. He's always advocating for his perfect plan, and that's one man, one woman, for ever okay verse 5 then continues on and it talks about this it says when a man hath taken a new wife he shall not go out to war neither shall he be charged with any business but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken and so while he's not charged with any business outside of the house his business is to be at home and cheer up his wife now i think in the the time of israel that we're referring to um, what would happen is there would be such lavish gifts that come upon them. He'd certainly be free at home to not go to work and not get involved in business and not go to war, do any types of things. It was easy to do. I couldn't imagine being doing something now. You get married nowadays and you've spent $60,000 or something crazy on the wedding. You definitely can't take a year off work at that point. And maybe this is the problem that we have. In our modern culture, what do we do? We spend a ton of money on the marriage and then we're immediately in debt, and then our marriage starts off in that first year just stressing out about money. Why would you want to start something off with, with such debt? I mean, to us, we spent a lot of money on that thing, but we definitely didn't go into any kind of debt. Our marriage was simple. When we see people that are spending mortgages on their weddings, yikes. That's not how you ought to start things off, but what God says is that there should be a freedom at home. In other words, what happens at home in the beginning should be simple because it ought not cost a ton. He says he should cheer up his wife, and that is his sole ministry for that first time. And I believe what happens in that free at home period, and then we see the importance of that first year together, getting to know one another. That's why I love the story of uh, Brother Raj and Miss Nicey, is that COVID allowed them a little bit of this free at home time, which is a blessing in disguise that some of us were wouldn't even consider. But man, for them, it was great. They got to be free at home and he got to cheer up his wife and when he when she gave that testimony the smile across her face just showed me that yeah absolutely he he cheered her up it cheered her up to be with her husband for that that time whether it was two months or three months or however long he was so that was then the charge for that man don't get busy outside of the house don't go to war but rather spend that time with your wife so those of us who haven't gotten married then then they can at least take principle out of this and say hey when I do get married, that first year has to be just about cheering up my wife. This also shows you that when the wife is sad, it indicates that what she came from was probably a pretty good situation. That's why God says, a man shall leave, they shall leave father and mother and cleave one to another. The wife, for the first time ever, has left her family, where she was cared for, where she was kept um, unto this time where she would be presented to an husband. The husband, for the first time, has left his house where now he is responsible for caring for the wife and taking care of, of the things that are needful for the house. And so they're both in this, this fresh scenario where ideally they would have been caring for their parent, cared for by their parents, and now they are caring for one another. And it ought to be something of growth in a fresh marriage. 
a, a great time and a great opportunity God has set forth for his people. And I think this is a fantastic idea. God's law is great. That uh, the families would care for the needs outside of the house so that they're provided for inside the house so that their only job is to just love one another and cheer one another up and get to know one another in that first year of marriage. Verse 6, it continues on. <clears throat> God's giving us more instructions for, I think, how things ought to be different in his way than how the world is. Because look at this. It says in verse 6, No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. Now, a pledge is simply a security deposit. It's a guarantee to pay or to do. It's the down payment to what your intent is in the next step. That's, that's the pledge. Now, God here says don't take a man's life to pledge. In other words, don't take all he is, all he has, all he's got. When it talks about the upper millstone and the lower millstone, you need both in order to get something done, in order to crush wheat, in order to grind stone, in order to do what you need. You need the top of the millstone and you need the bottom. So when they say don't take, when God says don't take any part of his millstone, you're taking his life if you do so. When you take a pledge, you're taking any ability that they even have to pay you back and then expecting them to pay you back. But isn't that how our world essentially works? They take a man's life for a pledge. When you, when you get a mortgage, the French, ver, the French word for mort, it's death. It's a, it's a death pact. You're literally taking their life. The banks are taking your life as a pledge. Because nobody can just go, okay, well, I can't pay, I can't, you know, nobody can just basically pay that thing off. It's not like they have reserves and they're just going to, no, you're expected to pay for that for the rest of your life. And this is the thing is I'm starting to look at some alternative ways of purchasing <clears throat> property and, and types of homes, cheap types and styles of homes. Like they do those, those um, shipping container homes and the tiny homes and the yurts and those types of things. But there is so much kickback with respect to, to, to getting, let's say, a house. I could go out and I could mortgage a house for half a million dollars. And they'd be happy to do it because I'm going to be involved in a pledge that is my very life. I'll pay for that for the rest of my life. They love that. But if I go to them and say, hey, would you give me a mortgage for $30,000 and I can buy a little sliver of land in a, in a reasonable house that I can build myself to live in, they're going to say no, and they're going to reject it. Why? Because I'm going to pay that thing off in two, three years tops. It's going to be done and gone. They, de they, don't, they want to get the man's life to pledge. And that's the exact opposite of what God expects. God doesn't expect you to take all from a man in order to get paid back. Because God says when you lend, lend expecting never to receive again. I was, honestly, that's how Christians ought to lend. Lend to somebody. If you see it, wonderful. Praise the Lord. If you don't, God will just bless you for it, and he'll take care of that loss that you have suffered. Why? Because you're supposed to lend and not even really think about it. Just because that's in our hearts to be a giving people. If you get it back, wonderful. And I know lots of people that have wonderful testimonies of that. I'm not quite there. That's a hard thing for me. That's a hard thing to do, but ultimately that's God's perfect will is to, to be like this with any of our finances or the things we have. You have it, but it's easily taken away. Do you know how we live? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine, I'm not, you know, I won't let go of it. No, you ought to be fluid with things coming in and coming out. Blessings in, blessings out. And God will work through people like that, but it takes a measure of faith. And this is what God here is offering his people as a result. The millstone is useless without both parts. So don't take one part to pledge and basically chop your borrower off at the knees, making it impossible for them to even pay you back, Right? I, I want, it's like the bank, if they just took out a mortgage, they gave you a mortgage, you're going to pay this month, and then they called up your employer and said all these things about you so you couldn't even go to work because you got fired. That's what it is. You're taking their life. You're making it impossible for them to even pay you back. But God doesn't want it to be that way. Verse 7, then, it says, If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel, and maketh merchandise of him or selleth him, then that thief shall die. Amen and thou shalt put away evil from among you. So this would be very simply child trafficking or kidnapping and, and selling people as if they are merchandise. And this is, of course, wicked. This is wrong. And it ought to be settled by quick and swift justice, death, to anybody who would capture a body, a human, and, and use them as merchandise. Last day's Babylon, 
has the souls of men as part of her merchandise. And so more and more and more and more, men are being caught, captured, and sold for their value, which is only as an asset. I don't know if you know, but according to the government of Canada, on the books, you're an asset, nothing more to them. Okay, They don't think of you as people. They think of you as an asset, and you're traded on the stock market, believe it or not. Look into that. It's bizarre, but that's how it works. <clears throat> right. So, continuing on, we see that God doesn't want it to be that way. You know what God here is highlighting? People aren't merchandise. People have value belong beyond that. Okay, so therefore, if you're going to steal and make merchandise of people, you ought to be put to death. Put away that evil from among you. And, and if we would have done that in the beginning and carried that through, we wouldn't have the problem that we have now because traffickers would be fearful of being destroyed. There wouldn't be so many of them getting involved in this filth. Verse 8, it continues, it says, Take heed in the plague of leprosy, that thou observe diligently and do according to all that the priests, the Levites, shall teach you as I commanded them, so shall you observe to do. Now in your own time, you can go back to Leviticus chapter 13 and Leviticus chapter 14 to observe the specific rules that the priests, Levites, gave with regard to leprosy. And we can take a lot of those and apply them to infectious diseases today. It would probably be a good refresher for all of us to go back and look at those. I've read through those passages, Leviticus 13 and 14, a few times in the last little while to see how God expects us to deal with it. But since we're not going to go into an in-depth study on that, look at what verse 9 says. He's going to draw us to a specific example. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam, by the way, after that you were come forth out of of Egypt. So they have left Egypt, and you can turn to Numbers chapter 12. They left Egypt at what time this story took place. And I think what God here is saying by using that verbiage there, remember what God did unto Miriam with respect to the plague of leprosy and observing diligently how the priests and Levites had you to do it. He says, remember what we did when you left Egypt. In other words, when you left the world, when you left off doing things their way, and with regard to um, infectious diseases, the world does things insane. <laughs> they, they, they don't have a clue with how to deal with these types of things because God knows best, and that's what he's going to show us here. In chapter 12 of Numbers, he's highlighting just one example of how he would deal with an infectious disease like leprosy. In verse 1, it says, Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, verse 2, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And so Moses marries a woman. They don't like it. And now they're challenging his leadership. <laughs> what a stretch, eh? Yeah. They don't like something he does. So now he's a bad leader. It's amazing how that, how that um, leap takes. So Moses in verse 3 is referred to. It says, the man Moses was very meek. Above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. In other words, he had great power, but he reserved it for appropriate times. He wasn't one that just, just flew off the handle. And so when they came at him and said, you know what, God speaks through all of us, Moses. How do you think you're, so, you're such a big shot? Moses probably just took it, heard it, and, and, and waited in order to react to it. I believe he also knew what verse 2 at the end says, the Lord heard it. And so he need not react. That's why... It, that's, that's where meekness originates. When you understand that God hears what's going on in your life, you understand that God will deal with what's going in your life, it makes you meek. You're not going to lash out. You're not going to have to fight your own battles. God heard it, and he knew what was going to happen. Verse 4, and The Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the, Moses, and the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. In other words, yes, you're right. Prophets like yourselves will hear from me in this fashion. I will make myself known in a vision. I will speak unto that man, or even yourselves, in a dream. But look at this, verse 7. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Moses had a specific job, a specific and, and, and higher, let's say, 
opportunity of fellowship with God. You'll find Moses talking back to God. You'll find Moses questioning God. But God allowed for that because they had that specific relationship. And here he makes that clear. Look, Moses is going to behold my similitude. I'm going to speak to him plainly, but you, on the other hand, are only hearing dark speeches. You, on the other hand, Aaron and Miriam, are only hearing what comes from dreams and visions. It's not as clear as you would expect to come from Moses. Therefore, why weren't you afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Why weren't you afraid to speak against my ordained leadership here? The man that I have chosen for this particular task. Verse 9, it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold... Now here's what we want to refer to in the context of Deuteronomy 24. It says, Miriam became leprous, white as snow... And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is hath consumed, when he cometh out of the mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Now he said, remember in Deuteronomy chapter 24, Remember what God did, Unto Miriam. What did God do unto Miriam? He gave her the plague of leprosy. And remember, what we're talking about is here how to observe to do according to what the priests and the Levites do. So what do they do here? Well, first and foremost, Aaron fears and stands back and, and basically asks for forgiveness of the leadership, Moses, the man who's talking to God, the mediator. We would go to Christ. He goes to the mediator and says, hey, don't let her fall or myself fall in that same sin that we have sinned he said don't let us be as one dead don't let us be consumed and then moses the mediator goes and cries out to the lord saying heal us now And what does god do verse 14 and the lord said unto moses if her father had but spit in her face should she not be ashamed seven let her be shut out of the camp seven days and after that let her be received again and Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. And the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people were removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. And so what did God say was basically the bottom line teaching of the priests, the Levites. When he was going to bring us just one example of how we ought to diligently do according to their teaching with respect to the plague of leprosy, what does he say? Shut her up. Put her out. Separate her from the company. The company wait for her. Stand guard for those seven days and then receive her in again. Very clearly, the bottom line is when we're dealing with infectious diseases, according to God and not according to Egypt, because I believe back in Deuteronomy chapter 24, he drew that line very clearly. Remember what the Lord did after you came out of Egypt. Remember what God did and how he dealt with this plague after you left the world's way of doing things? after you stepped forth out of the land of Egypt, remember what God did? God allowed for her to get that plague. And then God said to the people, put her away. Seven days, just wait, and then bring her back in. That's how you ought to deal with infectious diseases. And yet here we are, locked down, everybody told to go home. No, you know what we should be doing? We should be taking the ones that are sick, we should be taking the ones that are at risk of getting very sick and dying and putting them away and separating them and quarantining them. That's fine. And the rest of us should just go back to business as usual. Amen. The rest of us should just get on with our lives because this is no different than last year and last year and the year before that in regards to the infectiousness and the severity of the disease that is at hand. This is no different than any year. And this is certainly no different than the plague of leprosy. Study leprosy. It was awful. You didn't need to get tested to determine if you had leprosy. We're living in a time when we have a disease that is so deadly, you need to be tested to determine if you have it. And they're set to bring us a vaccination that is so effective and safe that they're threatening people in order to get them to take it. It's a mixed, mixed up, messed up world. Did Aaron have to... Look at Miriam and go, here, let me test you, determine if you have leprosy. Immediately he was like, ah, she has leprosy. Moses, pray for her. Moses, I pray that this wouldn't come upon me. Because they were standing in his presence. But also, what else do you see didn't happen in this scenario? 
She had leprosy. God said, put her away seven days. You know what they didn't do? They didn't say, well, because Moses and Aaron were in the tabernacle with her. And you know, the tabernacle, this is one of those super spreading places, like they're calling churches, right? This is a super spreading place because God meets here and then God's people come here and then they all get leprosy and then they all spread it around because they're shaking hands and hugging one another and praying for one another. Oh, no, oh, have mercy on us. Well, now we have to take Aaron and put him away because he was near her. Now we have to take Moses and put him away because he was near her. We should also find out who they saw earlier in the day because we don't know when she contracted leprosy. It could have been seven days earlier and she was just asymptomatic of leprosy. And so now we have to connect all the dots and then next thing you know, everybody for fear of leprosy is put away. No, everybody went business as usual. You saw the plague on her. It was, there's no way of hiding it. They put her away. And that's how God then expects us to observe diligently, do according to all the priests the Levites shall teach you, as I commanded them, so shall you observe to do. This is the example he puts forth. Three people in a tent, one of them gets infected. You see it, put her away. The other guys, go back to business as usual. Seven days, work around the camp, do the things, wait for her. All right, she comes back, welcome her back in. She's good. Everything's good. And now we see that the world, Egypt, does things very differently. God forbid. <clears throat> Verse 10, we'll continue on. Verse 10, it says, When thou dost lend thy brother anything, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring out the pledge abroad unto me. This is saying that when somebody gives a pledge, it's willingly. Like somebody willingly gives the down payment. We're not going to their house and twisting their arm to give us the down payment, but we ought to just let them bring it. In other words, there's no compulsion here. It's a willing offering. I will pay you and here's my pledge, okay? Now it continues on. Here's another example. It says, and if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. So here, the pledge obviously is raiment, because it says that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee, okay? So essentially, the poor man has nothing to give, so he gives the very coat off his back and says, this is my pledge that I will pay thee. But the pledge ought to be of no significance unto the lender, as much as it is of significance unto the borrower. And so his mentality ought to be, hey, thank you for the pledge. Thank you for proving to me more than your word by a offering, a, a, a down payment of what you are going to give me. He says, thank you for that. I believe you're going to pay me. And you know what? I don't want you to be cold. So we'll put this thing on your back and go sleep. You know what? He'll be blessed as a result of that. The poor man should not be stripped of his very his very method of keeping warm any more than a man ought to give his own life for a pledge. Because for some people, the clothes on their back is all they have. And, and it, it would be a shame for somebody to lend them something and then take their very life. A coat on somebody's back that is poor is the difference between life and death. And that's what God is saying. Hey, God's people ought not to take a man's life to pledge that they would pay back some debt. <clears throat> we continue on. Let's see what I got. Yeah, the Bible does say, let us lend, hoping never to receive again. Just, just lend. Let it go. Verse 14, it says, Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shalt the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and sitteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. If you ever get into an opportunity where you hire somebody out, or whether you are a boss and you have employees, this is a principle that you ought to heed. I understand that most employees will play, pay you weekly or bi-weekly, but... If somebody that is poor comes and works for you, say somebody's going to help you, you know, work on your house or build your fence or they're going to clean your car and shovel your driveway or whatever, 
You ought to be prepared, even if your agreement is, hey, I'll pay you once a month to clear my driveway every time it snows. If that's your agreement and they come unto you as that hired servant and say, hey, I, I need that money. I shoveled today. I need the money today. You ought to be ready to give it. Lest, the Bible says, God hear their cry and it be sin unto thee. I believe that it ought to be work done, service done, payment rendered. Just, just one for one. Because it says here that this man, at his day, you should give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it. Why? Because he setteth his heart upon it. In other words, he really needs that. He really desires it. His heart is on that cash. And that's why he's doing the work. Some of us can manage to budget. And my work pays me after I've already done the work two weeks ago, right? I'm okay with that. It works for me just fine. But if I go to my employer and say, look, hard times have come. I need to be paid for the work that I did this week now, okay? Then they ought to, according to the true Christian teachings, be able to just cut the check and go, right? It ought not to be something where it's, it's hoarded up and kept in store and we'll pay you somewhere down the line because the heart was upon it. It really was needed. The desire was there to have that money. And that ought to be good principle for us if we ever... If we ever hire somebody or own our own business or anything, to just have that money ready. And if somebody needs it, no questions asked. They get it. And that will be a blessing unto you if you're able to do such thing. Verse 16, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for their own sins. In other words, we know the fact that the sins of the fathers can have an effect on us. So certainly... If my dad made a bunch of bad decisions, it got me into the place where I'm in. And you know what? My dad was an unbeliever and came from an unbelieving family. And so their sins in that definitely had an effect on me because I grew up agnostic, not thinking I could know a God. But maybe there's something out there. And I lived my life with that belief. And as a result, made a bunch of bad decisions. So his sins, the sins of the fathers, can have an effect on me. And working that backwards, my sins can have an effect on my father. Think of the things that I did when I was 16 and the stupid things that I did. It certainly affected him when he had to pick me up from the drunk tank. It certainly affected him when he had to deal with things that I broke as a kid. You know, smashing windows and I had no money to pay for it. Or whatever dumb things that I did. Sins affect people that are near you. Absolutely, none of us are an island unto ourselves. But the Bible here says the punishment or the restitution should never come upon anybody else but the sinner. Okay? So anytime punishment is rendered from God, the Bible says every man shall be put to death for their own sin. I guess that just gives us a little bit of a picture of the fact that when Christ was put to death, he actually had to take our sins upon him. They are no longer, when we believe by faith, our sins. And that's the amazing gift that comes from the atonement that takes place. Because in reality, this principle says that I ought to be put to death for my own sin. But Christ lived the perfect life that I couldn't live and died the death that I do deserve. And when he did that on the cross, the Bible says that all of my sins and yea, the sins of the whole world were put upon him. And so he was put to death at that time for his own sin. Our Lord that never sinned was put to death for his own sin only because he took the sins willingly upon himself, sins that he had never committed. And that's a wonderful and another blessed picture of the atonement that has taken place is he that knew no sin became sin for us and as a result was able to be put to death for his own sin. It was my sin. It was your sin. It was the sins of the whole world at that time. Verse 17 continues, it says, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherness, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. But thou shalt remember that thou wast the bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee this thing. So, in the next few verses, what we're looking at here, and what we're remembering is the fact, ye were bondmen, but what are we now? We are bondmen to Christ. A change has taken place. And those that served the God of, the, of, of their fathers of the Old Testament were in the same position. Ye were bondmen to the world, but now ye ought to do things differently because you've been redeemed out of Egypt. You've been brought forth from thence. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. And you know what? God also empowers us to do these things. What is this one an example? Don't pervert judgment of somebody just because they're a stranger or fatherless. In other words, don't take advantage of people that can't help themselves. We ought to instead help those that can't help themselves. 
Verse 19, it says, When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all thy work. So again, don't be greedy. Don't collect everything to yourselves just like the world would, just like you may have learned in Egypt. No, do things differently. Collect the harvest and leave the sheaves as they fall. For who? The stranger, the fatherless. Just as Egypt never gave you a thing that didn't have a something tied to it, strings attached to it, you, you know, you don't get your welfare check from the government without a big string attached to that, right? So Egypt never gave to you. Egypt never helped you. E Egypt never lent to you, hoping to never receive again. But you ought to be different. Why? Because, verse 20, it says, When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, and for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. You ought to remember, it says in verse Verse 22, and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. I'm commanding you to do something different than the world that you came out of. I'm commanding you to not be as Egypt as the world. Look, you were bondmen then, and now the only thing that you're bearing is the precious word of God, taking that with you. You served the world then. Now you're serving Christ, and Christ says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And he says, hey, you were bondmen in the land of Egypt. Now I'm commanding you to do this, commanding you to do something different, something better, something that helps your neighbor, helps the stranger, helps the fatherless, helps the widow, something that isn't selfish. You learned a different way in the past, but now things are different. Now you need to live the way I am commanding you, because you came out of Egypt, because I brought you out of the world, I redeemed thee from thence. Therefore, I'm commanding you to do this thing. And I believe that's exactly what he's trying to command us. Look, the world, and in these examples, has their way of doing things. And a lot of us learned the world's way of doing things when we grew up in Egypt and lived and served in their bondage. But now... Christ has redeemed us. Therefore, he commands us to live differently. Not only that, he also empowers us to live differently through the word of God, through his exhortation, through the spirit that is living in us. He wants us to leave the ways of Egypt and serve him. Whipping up bondage to serve the world, serve Christ. His burden is easy. His burden is light. Take that yoke upon you and learn of me, Christ says. And that's what we're doing when we study, amazingly enough, Deuteronomy. We're taking Christ's burden upon us. We're learning of Him in these passages. And it's been a wonderful blessing. I thank you, God.